Welcome, everybody. I wanted to introduce totally unimodular matrices. I'm a Californian, so I, I guess I can get away with it. But it, it sounds to me like a like a Californian surfer, you know, oh, totally unimodular. But in any case, um, so what does it mean for a matrix to be totally unimodular? So every square submatrix has determinant 0, 1, or negative 1. So here's an example. I've, I've drawn a matrix for you. A matrix can be totally unimodular, even if it's not square, right? So I can't take the determinant of a non-square matrix. But let's say I remove some of the rows and columns. So maybe I remove all but three columns, and then I also remove a row. Okay. What remains is a three by three matrix. Right? So it has these nine entries. All right. And you need the determinant of the square remaining matrix in green to be plus or minus one. And, and you can see that this example does have determinant plus or minus one, because if I want to take the determinant of the thing in green, you know, I could do cofactor expansion along um, this top left entry. Right, um, and I guess the left column, right? So I have one times the determinant of this two by two matrix, which is zero. Okay, so this particular green sub matrix at square has determinant zero, so we're fine there. But this has to be the case for every square sub matrix, so. You know, maybe I just cut off two columns and I have a square four by four matrix. That determinant has to be zero, one, or negative one. You know, I could cut off everything besides this two by two matrix. That has to have determinant zero, one, or negative one. You can even cut down everything besides a one by one square matrix. Okay, that has to have determinant 0, 1, or negative 1, which just means that every entry of this matrix has to be 0, 1, or negative 1. So when I first heard about these, which was probably uh, eight years ago, although I haven't really studied them, I thought it was a pretty restrictive criterion, right? Like, when are you ever going to find a totally unimodular matrix? It sounds hard to even construct a totally unimodular matrix. but We'll see they arrive, they arise quite frequently in linear programming problems. Um, they arrive in vertex covers. Um, they arrive in matchings for bipartite graphs. And that's just because the incidence matrix of bipartite graphs, as we'll see in the next video, um, those are totally unimodular. Totally unimodular matrices also arrive in max flow min cut problems. So this particular matrix actually came from a max flow min cut problem. I have four vertices, one, two, three, and four. And then I have six edges, right? You see those? And what this matrix actually is, is it's the signed incident matrix for all these edges and vertices. So since the first edge goes from vertex 1 to vertex 2, I have a negative 1 in the v1 entry and a positive 1 in the v2 entry. And you know, e5 goes from vertex 3 to 4. So that's why in the e5 column, I have a negative 1 for the vertex 3 row and a positive 1 for the vertex 4 row. All right, so in this max flow min cut problem, you're trying to maximize the flow from the source to the sink. And often people solve this problem by producing a directed edge going backwards. And so you're trying to like maximize the circular flow and, and you often get totally unimodular matrices. Questions so far? All right. Let's do a non-example. If you ever have four entries,
that look like this, a one, a one, a negative one, and a one on the same two columns or the same two rows, then this matrix is certainly not totally unimodular because here's a square two by two matrix whose determinant is one minus negative one or two. So this is some sort of configuration that you have to avoid even if all of your entries are, are zeros and, and ones and negative ones. Cool. If a matrix A is totally mod unimodular and you augment it by adding a standard basis vector, then it remains totally unimodular. Just because when you look at subsquare uh, matrices, of this augmented guy, either you cut out this column, and so you just have a sub matrix of A, which necessarily has determinant one or negative one, or if this column's included, you know, it might be included and not have that row with the one, in which case the determinant is zero, or if this rightmost column is included and you do have the row with the one, then the determinant by cofactor expansion is just, you know, the determinant of a, again, of a smaller square submatrix of A. So in any case, taking a totally unimodular matrix and augmenting it with these standard basis vectors with only a single one maintains the total unimodularity. The main theorem about total, totally unimodular matrices is the following. Consider this linear program where you're maximizing C transpose X subject to AX at most B and um, X is non-negative and our matrix has size N by M, M by N as usual. Okay, so it turns out that if, if our constraint matrix A is totally unimodular, and if our constraint vector B has integer coordinates, remember Z is just the integers. So this means that B is a vector of length M with integer coordinates. And if this you know, solution is solvable, if there's an optimal solution, then furthermore, we know that there's an optimal integer solution. There's an optimal solution that has all entries in the integers. So what did we need? We needed A to be totally unimodular. We needed B to have integer coordinates. We didn't care about C at all. C could have you know, arbitrary entries. And so long as there's an optimal solution, then you can find an optimal solution whose values are furthermore integers. So this is the main theorem why people care about totally unimodular matrices. They're sort of saying that you can solve a linear programming pr problem where you constrain your vector to be integers. You can solve that just by considering this relaxed integer program where you don't have that constraint, you know, and then you can always find a solution satisfying that integrality constraint. The proof of this is really just the simplex method and then properties of totally unimodular matrices. They actually fit together quite well, um, as, as we'll see with, with basic feasible solutions. So let's prove this. We take our linear programming problem and we put it in equational form. So I need to introduce one slack variable for each of these inequalities. So I'm going to um, you know, augment my matrix with the identity matrix. And then I augment my vector of variables by adding M more variables, which are all slack variables. So now once we're in equational form, um, we, can, we can use the simplex method. Notice that you know, A was totally unimodular and I just extended it by a bunch of standard basis vectors. 
So A bar, this extended matrix is totally unimodular by the above example. Right here. Okay, so we solve A bar X bar equals B using the simplex method. You find an optimal basic feasible solution, X bar star, the star implies it's optimal. That optimal basic feasible solution has a corresponding basis, which is a subset of the variable indices. And then when I restrict this vector, this optimal vector to the, the entries in the basis, those are the only possible entries that can be non-zero, okay? And you can solve for those possibly non-zero entries, you know, just by doing the following, like, you know, Furthermore, this equation has to be true because the only entries of X bar that matter are the, are the ones that are possibly non-zero. So I can restrict the entries of my matrix and of my solution vector just to be the ones in the, in the basis. And then multiplied by this square matrix, A bar restricted to B, multiplied by the inverse, okay? So then I solve like this. X bar B restricted to the variables in the basis is the inverse of the square matrix times vector B. Sort of a standard equation from the simplex method. All right. So A was totally unimodular, which meant that this augmented matrix A bar was totally unimodular which means that when you take a square submatrix like A bar B and take its determinant, by definition, you get either negative one or zero or one. It's just the definition of totally unimodular. And it's cool how you know these basic feasible solutions, which correspond to taking square submatrices, fit so well with that definition of totally unimodular. In a basic in a basis, right, for capital B to be a basis, the square matrix is furthermore non-singular. In other words, its determinant's not zero. So the determinant is either negative one or one. Kramer's rule is a way to find the entries of an inverse matrix. And all of the entries are sort of like products and sums of the original entries of your matrix divided by the determinant of your original matrix. So, so our matrix AB, you know, A sub B, all of its entries are ones, negative ones, zeros. They're all natural numbers, they're all, or they're all integers. And then the denominator is either one or negative one. So when, when you take an integer and divide it by one or a negative one, you still get an integer. All right, so in this inverse matrix, all of the entries are integers. And that really relied on the fact that the matrix AB had determinant one or negative one. So all of these entries are integers. By assumption, all of these entries in vector B are integers. And then when you multiply this integral matrix by an integral vector, you get an integral vector. So all of the entries of X bar star are integers. And then when I give rid of the slack variables, all of the entries X solving my original problem way back up here are also integers. Questions about that? So yeah, this is why people care about totally unimodularity, uh, total unimodularity. If your constraint matrix is totally unimodular and so is your constraint vector, then 
finding a solution that's optimal means you can furthermore find a possibly different optimal solution with integer entries. One place this comes up in my research area, applied topology, is in the following paper by Tamal Day, Anil Hirani, and Bala Krishnamurthy. Um, I think one of the students in, the, in our class, um, I won't say that their name for privacy is sort of uh, looking into this paper or knows about this paper. So um, in topology, I study holes and uh, loops, um, but loops are one-dimensional holes, but I also study higher dimensional holes. And you might have a hole, like this one-dimensional hole in red, wrapping around this hollow torus. And I might ask, what's the, um, what's the shortest loop in that same homology class that's sort of topologically equivalent? You know, what's the shortest loop? And in this paper, they show how to solve that problem. So you can find an, a shortest loop that's homologous to a given loop um, using linear programming and total unimodularity. Another example would be maybe you start with this red loop going around the inside ring of the donut, and then you solve for an optimal one in the same homology class, and you end up with this green. So, you know, topologists also study 2D holes or 3D holes or 4D holes or 5D holes. Down below, we have a picture with a two dimensional hole. So our shape is this uh, coconut shell. Okay, it includes all of these tetrahedra outside of the green ball, you know, up until, up until the red ball. So I've cut the coconut shell in half, but pretend this is a full coconut. So I might start with this um, two-dimensional hole on the outside and then ask, what's the two-dimensional hole that's homologous to this one that has the fewest number of simplices or that has the smallest area, whatever you want to optimize. And when you optimize that, this algorithm will find this core of the coconut. You know, it shrinks it down to be as small as possible. All right, that's all I wanted to say about total unimodularity. Questions? Thanks so much. <laughs>